And I've been tasked today with trying to convince you that the next big question is, how do our genes make us healthy and sick? Your genome is the most important asset that you have, but at the current time, we don't really know much about what it does or how it works for you. The second point is that genes influence all aspects of your life, but we know little of the process of how they work, what the mechanisms underlying these diseases actually are. And the third point is technology is now poised to be available to us that will allow us to decipher our complete genomic or genetic blueprint but really, at the present time, we don't know much about what that information means or how it will affect your life. Nine out of the 10 leading causes of global death actually have a genetic component. We've reached this inspiring moment where we can work with single electrons, with single atoms and molecules. It's inconceivable that we would not seek to make our electronic devices work individually with these fundamental building blocks of nature. Just, here I'll get a bit melodramatic, as it is inconceivable that no human would have attempted to climb Mount Everest. <laughs> and I might add, just as Everest was not conquered by someone climbing alone, the collaborative approach fostered by CIFAR is essential for a challenge of this magnitude. <laughs> Most significantly to tonight's debate, Lots of really big questions about our world and universe will become more answerable through greatly increased computational capacity. Science has just become completely tied up with computers. But as astonishing as modern computers already are, it's fair to say that they still can't give much insight into very many really big questions. This underscores my ultimate position on why control of single electrons should be our next big question because it's the enabling tool to unlock a whole treasure chest of really big answers. The brain is absolutely the best computer in the world at a whole bunch of tasks that we'd like to build machines to do, and we have no idea how it works. So we're just trying to, uh, to figure it out. So uh, it's not just about building neat robots and uh, you know, cute devices. Once we understand how the brain really works, I think the impact is going to be extremely dramatic. So education and psychology are really going to be transformed as much by knowing how the brain works as medicine was transformed by really knowing how the body works in a scientific way. You know, the era of sort of pre-scientific medicine was very, very crude because there was no sort of fundamental understanding of how it worked. And so especially our understanding and treatment of neurological diseases, memory disorders, learning disabilities, both in adults and children, is going to take just an absolutely huge step forward. Why do we want to look at what makes people happy? In fact, it's one of the kind of classic questions. It's something that's been of interest to philosophers for a very long time. In particular, it was something about which Aristotle pondered at great length. And it was something that he saw as being central to the very meaning of life. A lack of money can make you unhappy, and certain, I'm sure many of us have had that experience, okay, but having more money and more and more money will not make you more and more happy. It kind of, it, it kind of tops out, so you get a kind of ceiling effect once you've got a certain amount. Similarly, the same is true for health. Health is something of a dissatisfier. If you have bad health, you feel miserable, but actually when you have good health, you take it for granted, okay. But it's a question that we need to get now uh, right, and that we need to start getting right, for more than just the philosophical reasons that Aristotle was worried about, but it's one that we need to get right for families, for the workplace, for communities, and perhaps most pressingly of all, for the planet as a whole.